Hi everyone, this is the Math 124 note outline video for the just-in-time review section. So this is the first section that we're going to cover in Math 124 and it's mostly prerequisite stuff. So actually everything in this section, in this note outline, is supposed to be already, you're already supposed to be comfortable with this material. Um, it's just more of a review just in case you need a refresher on some of these items. And this section is in your textbook as, as well. And in my textbook, it's on page 595 through 619. And if you look in those uh, on those pages, which you should definitely do, you should go through all of it, uh, there are 25 sections in total. And I just chose the ones that uh, to put in this packet that I thought were the most useful for the topics that we're going to cover the rest of the semester, but really you should review all 25 of them. This packet has maybe 10 of the 25 and it's still kind of a lengthy packet. So I didn't want to overwhelm with a lot of stuff that you might already know or stuff that we won't use as much in our course. So a lot of this is just going to be kind of a brief review. And we're going to start with a review of fractions. I'm not going to do any actual examples of the fraction stuff. This is just general directions for how to deal with fractions. So first to add or subtract two fractions. We have step one. Make sure that the fractions have a common denominator. And so often we'll call that the LCD. And once the fractions have that common denominator, step two, then you just add straight across the top. And on the bottom, you keep the denominator the same in your final sum or difference. And then step four, very important, always make sure that you reduce. So that's for adding or subtracting two fractions. The next one is multiplying two fractions. It's much easier than adding subtractions and it's easier than subtracting fractions because you don't need that LCD first step. All you have to do, it doesn't matter what the, what the denominators are. All you have to do is multiply straight across the top and then also just multiply straight across the bottom. So multiply straight across the top and the bottom. And then step two, once you've done that, don't forget to reduce. Always reduce your final fraction answers. And then dividing fractions. If you want to divide a fraction by another fraction, again, you don't have to worry about what the denominators are. You're just going to start by step one, multiplying the first fraction by the reciprocal of the second fraction. So what that's saying, this word here, the reciprocal, Let's say you have a fraction A over B. That's a fraction. And also important for fractions, the bottom is never zero. So I'm going to make a special note of that. Uh, the bottom of a fraction can never equal zero. The top can be zero, the numerator can be zero, but the denominator can never be zero. So that's why I wrote that there, that B cannot equal zero, because we're saying that B is the denominator of the fraction. So we have a fraction, A over B. Then if you want to talk about the reciprocal of that fraction, that's B over A. 
That's what it means by the reciprocal. So if you want to divide a fraction by a fraction, you take that first fraction and then you multiply it by the reciprocal of the second fraction. And then once you've done that, step two, reduce as always. Anytime you're answering any math question, once you get to your final answer, whether it's a fraction or some other expression, you always need to reduce it. Always put it in its simplest form that you can. Okay, next let's switch to a different topic, absolute value. <clears throat> I think there's kind of a misconception about absolute value. I think a lot of people will think of absolute value and they're just like, oh, I'm just going to make everything positive. But that's not what absolute value actually means. So if you read this definition here, it says the absolute value of a number A is the distance that the number A is from zero on the number line. So really, anytime you take the absolute value of something, all, it's, all that means is you're asking how far away is that number from the number zero. That's what absolute value is. And then a special note, anytime I have these notes in the notes, it's important and that's why I'm saying note. I think sometimes people are like, oh, it's just a side note, it doesn't matter, but actually it's like really important and it's oftentimes things that people <clears throat> make common mistakes about. So that's why I include notes like this sometimes. So note, it does not mean to change all the plus signs, or sorry, got that backwards. It does not mean to change all the minus signs to plus signs. That's not what absolute value means, okay? Um, and then as far as the actual mathematical definition goes, that, that's gonna be here in the box. So the absolute value of A is equal to A if A is greater than or equal to zero, and it's equal to minus A if A is less than zero. And don't worry too much about that definition. If it makes sense to you, great. And if it doesn't, then either talk to me about it during office hours, um, but it's not something that is uh, gonna be super stressed in this content. Let's just go to some examples. So part A, it just says the absolute value of five. So what you really wanna think of this as is you, you think about the number five and where it is on the number line. So maybe we have zero here and then we have five here. So it's just asking how far is that distance? Well, from zero to five, it's five away. So the answer is five. If we go down to part B, it's asking the absolute value of zero. So it's literally asking, if you think of where zero is on the number line, it's asking you how far away is zero from zero? Well, obviously that's zero away. For part C, we have negative 12 and zero. So for part C, if you take the absolute value of negative 12, all it's asking is how far away is the number negative 12 from the number zero? Well, they're 12 away from each other. And then part D, I'm not gonna actually answer this particular one. Uh, the reason I put part D in here is more to <clears throat> show an example of what not to do. So with this, a lot of people make a mistake. They see something like this and they do something and I'm just gonna write basically don't do that. So this does not equal x plus nine. And that kind of ties into the note that I put above which is a lot of people just, they just see the minus signs and they're like, oh, I'm just gonna make it plus. I'm just gonna make all the minus signs plus, but that's not what you should do here. And so for part D, I'm gonna leave it at that. <clears throat> we will get into something 
like that um, later on in the semester. But that's all we need to know at the moment. So let's go on to the next page, <clears throat> talk about exponential notation. So exponents. So say we have a, that's a number, it's going to be a real number, and then we have n, n is going to be a positive integer, so like a positive whole number, and if we have those, then the nth power of a is what's here in the box, a to the power n, or you can say that that's the nth power of a, and all that means is you take a and you multiply it to itself, n times. So whatever that exponent is, whatever n is, that's how many a's that you multiply to it themselves. So we do this n times. Multiply a to itself n times. And then we have, of course, the, the number n, that's called the exponent. So that's here. n is called the exponent of this expression. But what's the a called? The a is called the base of the expression. So that's just a little vocab. <clears throat> and then in the next box, we just have a couple exponent rules. So we have a to the power zero. So if you have a number, a number that's not zero, and then you take a to the zero power, that will always equal the number one. And then sometimes we deal with negative exponents. So you see this negative exponent here. We don't really like to deal with negative exponents if we can avoid it. So there's a way to convert between from negative exponents to positive exponents. That way we don't have to worry about the negative exponents. And the rule for that is if you see something like a to the negative n, then you turn it into a fraction and you can say that it's one over a to the positive n, like that. So that's just helpful sometimes to get rid of negative exponents. So let's do a couple examples. So part a, it's the fraction in parentheses one third to the third power. So what that's telling you to do is you take the base, remember the base is the one third, and you multiply it to itself n times, and n is three. So we multiply one third to itself three times, and then we kind of reviewed talking about how to multiply fractions. So for multiplying fractions, you just go straight across the top and straight across the bottom. So on top, we got one times one times one, which is one. On the bottom, we got three times three times three, which is 27. And then at that point, I would also ask myself, can I reduce the fraction? Because remember, make sure you always reduce them. But one over 27 is not reducible. So I'll box that as my final answer. And then part B to the right, What's the base? The base is this number 100,000. The exponent is the number zero. So that's that rule in the box. A to the zero is equal to one. So here we have 100,000 to the zero power. That's just gonna equal the number one. <clears throat> Part C, we have negative two to the fourth power. So I just want you to kind of look ahead, look at part C and look at part D. There's a slight difference between the two. Mm, what's the difference? In part C, the negative two has parentheses around it. And in part D, we don't have parentheses. And parentheses make a huge difference. Parentheses matter. So that's going to be something that you need to be paying constant attention to throughout the entire semester is parentheses. Sometimes you absolutely need to have them in certain spots. Sometimes you accidentally put them in certain spots and they shouldn't be there. So just always be aware of 
your parentheses and if you're using them properly. And really, if you remember PEMDIS, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, that can often help you figure out where to put parentheses. So for part C, we have negative two to the fourth. <clears throat> And it's in parentheses, so that's saying that the base is the number two. So we're going to take the base and multiply it to itself four times. A negative two times negative two is four times another negative two times another negative two. That's going to give you a positive 16 altogether because all of them are negative. So all the negatives are going to cancel out in pairs, which will leave us with a positive 16. Part D, I'm going to do part D in a few steps, but normally we wouldn't do them in all these steps. I'm just showing you how we're really getting our final answer for part D. So off to the side, I'm going to do kind of a side example. Think of the number um, negative 9. Another way to say that is negative one times nine, right? Or think of the number negative 100. Another way to say that is negative one times 100. Or negative nine, no, let's go with negative 17. We can write that as negative one times 17, right? So I'm gonna do the same thing here for part D. We have minus two to the fourth. So I can rewrite that as negative one times two to the fourth, just like I did in the box over there. And now I'm gonna use PEMDIS. So we say, do we have any parentheses? No, move on to E. Do we have any exponents? Yes, we have two to the fourth. So that's the part that we would handle next. And two to the fourth means two times two times two times two, which is 16. And then we have negative one times 16. So now in PEMDIS, we're at the M and the D, multiplication and division. So now we'll multiply the two and we get negative 16. So look at part C and look at part D. The parentheses made a big difference because in part C, our answer came out to 16, positive 16, but in part D, our answer came out to negative 16. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And then part E, that's gonna be the other uh, rule that we wrote up earlier in the box, the A to the negative N. So I have a negative exponent here, and that's okay, but we'd prefer not to have the negative exponent. So one way to do that is to do one over three to the positive four, and then that's an exponent, so 3 to the 4th means 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. That's going to give you 81. And that's not reducible, so I box my answer. And the way that I show my work in this video and all the other videos is how you should be showing your work too. So pay attention to how I'm writing my workout, how I'm writing it step by step. I'm writing everything full out in every single step so that I'm not missing anything, and so that when you go back to, to read your notes, you can follow step by step. And when you do your work for the class, uh, there's gonna be times where I'm grading your steps. And I'm gonna grade your steps in the same way. I'm gonna say, can I follow this? Oh, here's step one, here's their step two, here's their step three, and it's done vertically down the page. There's not stuff written randomly in random places. Um, it's just very followable. So you should be doing your work and practicing it similar to how I demonstrate it, <clears throat> which includes boxing your final answers, okay? Box your final answers in this class. So next page, uh, laws of exponents. So you can kind of read through these laws in this box. 
they give a law of exponents and then they also give an example for each one. So I'm not really gonna go through all that, but I am gonna add a couple laws in. I'm gonna add the two that we already writ wrote on the previous page in the box. So, for number law number eight, I'm going to say that this is a to the zero equals one. We already talked about that. And then for law number nine, the other one that we talked about, a to the negative n equals one over a to the positive n. And then I'm going to add one more, oops, one more law in next to the law number two. And I'm going to call this law number 2b. Um, it's very similar to this law number 2 that's already written here. The a to the m over a to the n equals a to the m minus n. Uh, you can also do it kind of the reverse way, the kind of a flip-flopped way. And so say you have a fraction a to the m over a to the n. You can keep it as a fraction with the same base. Notice the base, the base is a in the numerator and the base is a in the denominator. And then you can do n minus m like that. So that's just one extra law that I find very useful. <clears throat> so for these on this page, I just want you to try to work on them on your own. And if you wanna check your answers, just uh, set up office hours with me, come to office hours and I'm, I would love to talk with you about this or any other topic. Um, please don't ever, ever, ever be shy to meet with me um, because one, better safe than sorry. Um, if there's something you're not sure of, I will 100% be able to help you with that and thus reach, hopefully, you know, be closer to reaching your goal, which I'm assuming is passing the class or getting a good grade in the class. So might as well do something that can help you achieve that goal, which is coming to my office hours, talking with me about things that you're not quite sure of. Um, usually the people who come to office hours consistently are the ones who end up with the higher grades in the class, uh, which does not surprise me at all. So. Anyway, I just want you to try those on your own, but I did give some hints um, for each one. So I told you which laws that you would be using for each of these examples, okay? Um, I'm just gonna move along. Like terms. This is a definition. Like terms are terms that have the same variable part. And you want to know about like terms because if you're trying to add terms together or subtract them, the only way that you're allowed to add or subtract two terms together is if they are like terms. So let's just practice deciding if, if we have pairs of terms and whether they're like terms or not. So for part A, we have this term and this term. The term eight, the, it doesn't have a variable part. And then eight X, the variable, variable part is X. So they have different variable parts. So no, they're not like terms. For part B, we have two y cubed versus negative two y cubed. Both of them have the same variable part, the y cubed. So yes, these are like terms. Part 
part c, negative 3 halves x, and 5x squared. So they both have the variable x in them, but the variable part has to be exactly the same. So in the first term, the variable part is just x, and then over here, the variable part is x squared, so they're different. So these are not like terms. And then part D, we have negative 3 halves xy and 5yx. But we know that if you multiply two expressions together, it doesn't matter what order you multiply in, right? Like if you think about 7 times 3, we know that's the same as 3 times 7. So same thing here. We have x times y. And here we have y times x as the variable. But that's the same worth. They're worth the same because you can just rearrange the y times the x and you'll get xy. So yes, these are like terms. Okay, so that brings us to the next part down here, which is adding and subtracting polynomials. So we want to simplify the following expressions. And so in part A, if I think of PEMDAS again, I think parentheses, so we have this, 3x minus 7, but those are not like terms, right? So we can't really do anything inside the parentheses, so then we move on to e, but there's no exponents, then we move on to m and d, which is multiplication and division. Right here, the 5 is being multiplied to the 3x minus 7, so I'm going to take the 5 and distribute it to the 3x and the minus 7. So 5 times 3x, we get 15x. And then don't forget about the minus, minus. And then 5 times negative 7 gives us the minus 35. And then at the end, we have the minus 6x. And at this point, I look at my expression, 15x minus 35 minus 6x. I have three terms. And two of the terms are like terms, so I can combine them. I can do 15x, subtract 6x, get a 9x, and then minus the 35. And at this point, I'm going to box my answer because those are not like terms. We can't combine them. And so that's the simplest form of that answer. For part B, First thing I see here is this minus and then the parentheses after it. So it's really kind of like saying minus one times what's inside the parentheses. So always distribute minus across parentheses. Um, so these parent the first parentheses I can just kind of drop because there's nothing in front of that. But in the next one, I'm going to distribute the minus. So I'm going to get minus 2, and then minus with a minus gives me a plus 4y squared. So you're going to see that a lot in the class, so make sure that you do this distribution of the minus sign. And then we have a plus y at the end. And at this point, I'm going to look for like terms. Uh, the 3y squared and the 4y squared, those are like terms. And then also the 10 and the minus 2. The 10 and the minus 2, those are like terms because they both don't have a variable part. So 10 minus 2 is 8. And then 3y squared plus 4y squared is a positive 7y squared. And then I got that plus y at the end. I can box my answer at this point because there's no like terms. Um, so that would be perfectly fine. Or I can order, I can kind of rearrange it into 
a more commonly written math expression, which is like you write all the terms in decreasing exponential order. You don't have to do this part, but it's just a kind of a more convention for math is to write the expression in decreasing exponential order. Okay, so that's that. Now getting into multiplying algebraic expressions. The most famous idea when you're multiplying algebraic expressions is the FOIL method, but technically the FOIL method can only be used to multiply two binomials together. And what a binomial is, is that just means that it's a two-term expression. So in the box, we are trying to multiply two binomials together. We have a plus b in parentheses, so that's a binomial, times in parentheses c plus d, that's another binomial. So for FOIL, FOIL stands for F-O-I-L, first, outside, inside, last. So A is the first term in that binomial, and so is C. So that's our F, multiplying A and C together, F for first. And then for the O, that stands for outside, meaning like if you look at this by these two binomials being multiplied together, you look for the outermost. So like A is kind of, it looks like it's on the outside and so does D. So these are outside, A and D, O for outside. And then I stands for inside. So the two on the inside, which are these two here, B and C. So that's I for inside. And then L stands for last, meaning the last term in each binomial. So B is the last term in the first binomial, and D is the last term in the second binomial. So L for last. First, outside, inside. So for example, part A. Part A has exponents in it, right? The exponent is the number two. So this one, people make a big mistake very often. So that's why I put this example in here so that we don't make that mistake. We start off on the right foot, we get it in our heads now so that we don't ever make the mistake again. And think about what does what did we talk about earlier in the section for exponents? What is that exponent telling you to do? Well, that means take the base, which in this case is the x minus 2. You take the base and you multiply it to itself two times. So that's what you need to do here is you need to write it out like I just did, x minus 2 times x minus 2. And at this point, now we're multiplying two binomials together, so now we're going to use FOIL. So first terms, x times x is x squared. Outside is the x times the minus 2. Pay close attention to negatives. So we have a positive x times a negative 2. So it's going to give us a negative 2x. And then we have the inside terms here, the negative two times a positive x. So again, we have a minus two x and then L for last. So that's the minus two and this minus two. So always just when you're doing this, if you're thinking in your head, think minus two and minus two. Like, so what I mean by that is if it's negative, tell yourself it's negative. Think about, oh, this is negative two. Think this is minus two so that you don't forget it. So we have a minus two times a minus two, which gives us the positive four. And now we read our expression, look for like terms. We have like terms in the middle, the minus two X and the minus two X. So if we have a minus two and we'll subtract two more, we'll get a minus four X plus four. 
And then at this point, we don't have any like terms. So we're done. I'm going to box my final answer. For part B, we have a, again, we have two binomials. Here's a binomial, 6x minus 4. The other binomial is 3x squared plus 2. So we're just going to do the FOIL method again. First is these two. We have a positive 6x times a positive 3x squared. So the 6 times the 3 gives us 18. And then we have the x with the x squared. So that's x cubed. Um, and then <clears throat> that's our f. And then we do o for outside. So the outside terms are the 6x and the positive 2. So 6x, 6x times positive 2 is plus 12x. And then we have i, so our inside terms, these two, remember we have a, it's a minus four and we're multiplying it to a positive three x squared. So that's minus 12 x squared. And then L last, that's a minus four times a positive two, so minus eight. And really, if you look at what we've written down for this, we can stop there, we couldn't box the answer that we already wrote down. But um, because there's no like terms. But I'm going to once again just do it the conventional way, which is to write the terms in decreasing exponential order. So start with 18x cubed, then the minus 12x squared, and then the plus 12x, and then the minus 8. So that's the FOIL method. Let's move on to multiplying polynomials. So really, uh, the top half of this page, we did multiply polynomials, we, but specifically we were multiplying binomials. Down here, this is just multiplying any two polynomials. So it doesn't have to be binomials. You can have three terms, four terms, five terms, as many terms technically as you want. So this is just the general situation. So whenever you're multiplying two polynomials, multiply each term in the first polynomial by each term in the second polynomial. So make sure basically that you're just pairing, making all the pairs that you can between the first and the second polynomial. So I will start with this term, the three. So I just need to make sure to multiply it to all three terms in that polynomial. So I have three times x squared, three x squared. Then I have a three times a negative five x, so that's a negative 15 x. And then I have a three times a positive two, so that's plus six. So I am done with the three. Then I move on to the 2x and I do the same thing. Make sure I just multiply the 2x by each of those terms. So 2x times x squared gives me a positive 2x cubed. And then a positive 2x times a negative 5x is a negative 10x squared. And then next we have the 2x times the positive 2. So that's a plus 4x. At this point, I look for like terms. And I'm going to start with the highest exponent first. So the highest exponent is the 3, the 2x cubed. So I'm going to write that one down first. That doesn't have any like terms, so I'm just going to leave it as that. Then the next one would be the x squared. And we do have like terms for that. We have a 3x squared minus a 10x squared. So 3x squared minus 10x squared is negative 7x squared. And then the next one was just would just be the x's. So we got a negative 15x and a plus 4x at the end. So minus 15, if you take minus 15 and you add 4, you're going to be at negative 11x. And then don't forget that plus 6 is in there too. And just double check that we don't have any like terms and we don't. Everything is in decreasing exponential order, so we can box our answer there. So let's move on to 
really the key part in this whole section, factoring expressions. This is extremely important. We're gonna use it a lot throughout the whole semester. You need to know how to factor expressions. Very, very, very important. And we are going to have three main techniques to do that. Talk about. So when somebody says, factor an expression, what that really means is like you're breaking the expression down into its factors, i.e. you are reversing the multiplication process. So for example, say somebody said factor the number 12. There's more than one way to do this, but the idea is that we're just breaking it down into multiplication. So for example, we could say that 12 is four times three. That's one way to factor the number 12. So by writing it as four times three, we factored it. Or we can say that 12 is equal to two times two times three. That's another way to factor the number 12. You just take that number, take the expression, and you break it down into multiplication. You reverse it into multiplication. So that's a really straightforward example is just to factor a number, but we're not gonna be just factoring numbers. We're gonna be factoring entire expressions. We're gonna be factoring polynomials. So like I said, there's three main techniques for doing this. And so this will be technique one. And in order to do technique two, you have to know how to do technique one. And in order to do technique three, you need to know how to do technique two. So each of these techniques is going to build upon the previous one. So you need to know all of it and you need to start with this one here, which is factoring out a greatest common factor. And the best way to go about doing this technique is just kind of doing examples. So let's look at the example. It says, also reading is very important. Always read the directions so that you know what your answer should look like. So these directions are asking us to factor out the greatest common factor of the following expressions. So look at part A. First of all, it's, it's good to get in the habit of, of asking yourself, how many terms do we have here? And in part A, we have two terms this one minus this one. So there's two terms, so it's a binomial. And all you're gonna do is ask yourself, what do these two terms have in common? Start with the number. So the first term has five and the second term is a 35. So what's the largest number that both of those are evenly divisible by? Well, five and 35 are both evenly divisible by the number five. So I'm gonna write down five. Now look at the variable part. The first variable part is c cubed d. And in the second term, the variable part is c. So do, do they have anything in common? They have different variable parts, but they do both have a c in common. So I'm gonna write c, and that's all they have in common. And then I'm gonna write parentheses because remember, we are undoing the multiplication process. So we're gonna write the parentheses to tell us that we are multiplying. And you go term by term, so we're gonna start with this term. And we are pulling the 5C out of each of these terms. So if we take a 5C out, what will we be left with uh, from this first term? 
Well, it has, the five will be gone, and then we have c cubed, but we're taking a c out, so we should be left with c squared, and the d, we're not doing anything there, so we'll write d as well. Then we have a minus sign in between, then we move on to the next term. If we divide 35 by 5, what will we get? We have a 7. And then we're taking the C out of that term, out to the front, so the C will be gone. And this is our whole answer. A lot of people will just write 5C, but that's not the answer. The GCF was 5C, but that's not our answer. It didn't ask us, what's the GCF? It told us to factor out the GCF. So what that means is you should still have an equivalent expression to the expression that we started with. And you can even check your answer. You can distribute the 5C back and you, and what, once you do that, you should get the expression that we started with. Um, so you can do that and just check on your own. Okay. Let's do another one. For part B, how many terms are there? One, two, three. So again, we're gonna ask ourselves, what do all three of these have in common? So always look at the number first. For B, or for the first term, the number is five. And really I should be saying the coefficient. The coefficient here is five. The second term, the coefficient is minus one. There's really kind of like an imaginary one in there. And then for the third term, the coefficient is the number three. Well, if you think of five and one and three, they don't have anything that they're all divisible by. So that part is done. So now let's move on to the variable part. The variable part here is for the first term, AB. The second term, the variable is AB cubed. And the third term, we have AB squared C squared. So if you think about all three of those terms, they all have an A in common. So I'll write that. And they all have a B in common and they don't have anything else in common. So then I'll write my parentheses, because we're gonna multiply. And then we're gonna start back over and just go term by term. And we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna pull out A, B from each of those terms and write what's left over. So for the first term, if we pull an A, B out, we're just gonna be left with that five. And then don't forget the next, the minus sign. Always be paying attention to your minus signs and your plus signs. Now we're on the second term, the AB cubed. We'll think that we're going to remove an A. We're going to pull an A out, and we're also going to pull a B out. But it's B cubed, so we'll have B squared left if we take out one of the Bs. And then next is plus, and look at the third term. We're going to remove an A, and we're going to pull out a B. So we'll be left with a three, we'll be left with a B, and we'll still be left with a C squared. So that is our factored form when we factor out the GCF. And again, if you wanna check your answer, you can distribute. I'm not gonna do that, you should do that on your own. Just check the answer, make sure that it does come out to what we started with. So here our GCF was AB, because that's what all three terms had in common. But again, that's not the answer because it didn't ask us what's the GCF, it asked us to factor, which means break it down into multiplication, and that's what we did. All right, now let's move on to <clears throat> the next technique.